Ms. Angeles and uh, team give us grand rounds today along with Dr. Mosca. Uh, there's uh, some uh, very nice kudos and, uh, and I'm gonna take the time to actually read through them. Uh, the first one is uh, for Prash Bremjit and it's from uh, Lisa McIntyre and Laura Hennessy. Uh, you know Dr. McIntyre and Laura Hennessy is a research nurse at Hyperview. I am not surprised, given your time with us last year on general surgery, that uh, you are doing a great job. Uh, keep up the great work and know that your words and caring demeanor are as important as any surgery you do. Uh, I wanted to pass on a conversation I heard this morning between uh, Dr. Bremjit and a patient. Uh, Dr. Bremjit was so patient and respectful of her. So much of the time everyone is busy, busy and easily uh, can easily forget how scared patients are when they have such a uh, terrible problem. Uh, he was so kind to her and I just wanted him to hear that even though she may not have responded to his kind words, I knew she, I knew she heard them and I'm quite sure they made her feel that uh, she will be well cared for. So I don't know if Prash is uh, here this morning, but uh, thank you. Uh, next, next one is about Brett Schiffman, and it's from uh, Dr. Veda and Laura Tom. Uh, hey, Brett. Uh, this is a little bit, uh, just a little bit uh, fragmented, as uh, Dr. Vetter can occasionally be. Uh, patient was very thankful and grateful for the team care that he had already s received. So thankful that he was uh, brought to tears. I thought you should know. High five, thanks for doing such a great job. Uh, patients uh, really do appreci appreciate all of your solid and uh, positive work. Uh, so do we. And then it goes on, it's so true. A 94-year-old who was the head clinical chemist at the Brigham at the time of uh, uh, Nobel laureate Joe Murray's first kidney transplant in the world, uh, he was moved to tears when describing how well he was uh, treated by you. Uh, so that's from Dr. Tom and Dr. Vetter, and, and thanks, Brett. I know you're here this morning. Uh, another one for Lauren McTaggart uh, from Cara Jo Mitchell. I uh, just wanted to pass along my compliments to your resident, uh, Lauren McTaggart. I had a conversation with her today about the care of one of Dr. Shu's shoulder patients. Very medically complex. Uh, she spent quite a long time on the phone with me exploring her differential and suggesting tests and treatment options. Uh, more often uh, than not in my 10 plus years of experience here, re residents either simply ask me as the medical consultant what to do. Uh, uh, or worse, and thankfully not very frequent, uh, dismiss uh, clinical findings uh, if they uh, don't fit with the post-op plan. Uh, so thank you, uh, Lauren, wherever you are. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, Colin Kennedy was selected for the Air Force's uh, only uh, hand fellowship this year, so that's really fantastic. Uh, he'll be able to participate in a civilian hand fellowship uh, with his uh, salary supported by the Air Force, uh, so congratulations, uh, Colin. So uh, our grand rounds this morning uh, is the flat foot care for the pediatric uh, and adult patients by doctors uh, Mosca, Sanjosen, and Sanjosen, and I suspect that most of our residents uh, know quite a bit about flat feet, but I think if most of the attendings are honest with themselves, uh, we probably uh, still don't have a, a good grip on uh, what it's all about. So uh, I, I, for one, am uh, looking forward to this grand rounds. So Adam. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chansky. Uh, my name's Adam, and I'm one of the R4 residents at UW. I'll be presenting on the definition, relevant anatomy, etiology, and history and physical of the flat foot. I'll then leave the management of the uh, pediatric and adult flat foot to my co-presenters. I wanna say uh, that I'm very grateful to Dr. Mosk and my dad for doing th with this with me as they're uh, really the two big influences that led me to choose foot and ankle surgery as a career path. Um, I also think it's very cool to get to do this uh, with my dad. Uh, Dr. Chansey told me that he thinks that this would be a first for our department. And I think that middle picture is the last time he was seen without a beard. Um, <laughs> Uh, defining the flat foot, uh, a flat foot is a loss of the longitudinal medial arch with the following segmental deformities. 
Here you can see the loss of the medial arch. I'm um, looking at a patient from the back. You can see the hind foot valgus. Uh, there's also relative forefoot supination, which is uncovered um, when you take the hind foot and put it into varus. And this is taken from Dr. Mosca's book. Uh, this is a simplified graph uh, showing the relative abduction and dorsiflexion of the first metatarsal compared to the talus. On the left, you can see the relative abduction, and on the right, you can see the relative dorsiflexion of uh, flat foot. Um, this image also shows midfoot abduction and dorsolateral peritalar subluxation or positioning. Um, depending, the terminology depends on the image you're looking at and who you're talking to. Um, uh, there are both static and dynamic stabilizers to foot shape. Static stabilizers are listed here and include the important spring ligament and plantar fascia. Uh, these are much more important during ma to maintain the foot shape during stance. Uh, dynamic stabilizers, including the posterior tibial tendon, I would argue, are more important during gait and do uh, not fire during stance. Um, the spring ligaments is an important static stabilizer. Uh, it originates broadly on the calcaneus and inserts broadly on the navicular. It acts as a tension band to support the shape of the foot and also as a sling to hold up the tailor head. This image is taken from Dr. Mosca's book with the tailor head removed showing the acetabulum pedis. Um, and you can see how the foot can move about the tailor head um, with this structure. Uh, here's a picture from Netter just showing the deltoid ligament and the spring ligament. Another important stabilizer is the plantar fascia. Um, it originates on the calcaneal tuberosity and inserts broadly, including at the base of the proximal phalanges. Um, it works um, both as a tension band and then also through the windlass mechanism, um, shown in a simplified version here. When the toes dorsiflex during toe off, the plantar fascia is placed under tension, and this actually uh, increases the arch height of the foot. Um, uh, Foot shape is also driven by balance of extrinsic muscle forces. Uh, the primary dynamic stabilizer is the posterior tibial tendon. And uh, insufficiency of this is associated with symptomatic acquired flat foot. Uh, this muscle is opposed by the perineus brevis. The perineus longus is also a uh, important contributor to foot shape and works to plantar flex the first metatarsal. Um, here you see the posterior tibial tendon um, broadly inserting on the midfoot and hindfoot and working to um, invert the midfoot. It's important to note that it's hypovascular just below and distal to the medial malleolus, which predisposes it uh, to injury. This demonstrates the posterior tibial tendon action to cause the acetabulum pedis to rotate down and in, which we hear a lot from Dr. Mosca. Uh, this locks the transverse tarsal joint and allows the medial column to act as a stiff lever during toe off. This concept's also important when testing for an Aquinas contracture. There are two schools of thought regarding the role of the posterior tibial tendon. One is that it's the primary cause of uh, adult acquired flat foot. Another school of thought is that the height of the arch is determined by osseoligamentous structures, and the muscles are only there for um, during gait to control foot shape. Uh, this was supported by Basmagian as well as uh, Suzuki who looked at EMG activity of the posterior tibial tendon. Uh, this graph shows decreasing frequency of action potentials as you go from left to right and re relax standing in a given muscle. As can be seen here, the posterior tibial tendon is either rarely firing or not firing at all during stance. Um, Besmajian showed that loads of 100 to 200 pounds on one foot are borne easily by the passive structures. And even when you uh, put 400 pounds on one foot, not all patients are firing their uh, posterior tibial tendon. Um, to discuss the etiology of flat foot, uh, this is a busy slide. The key point is, is that flat foot is a shape and not a deformity. A flexible flat foot is normal, and a flat foot is a normal part of development in children and often goes away as they age. This is supported uh, in this study that looked at 835 Austrian school children 54% of three-year-olds had flat feet, whereas only 24% of children from the same group at six had flat feet. And almost all of these were asymptomatic. Uh, this graph demonstrates the same and shows that young children have a lower arch, which tends to correct as they age to a more normal adult foot shape. Uh, these two graphs are taken from two studies from Dr. Staley and Dr. Vanderwild looking at foot imprint shape and also radiographic parameters of the flat foot. 
Treating flexible flat foot with bracing has been shown to be ineffective in changing foot shape and socially stigmatizing. Uh, Harrison Beef looked at 3,600 Canadian soldiers during World War II and showed that 23% of them had flat feet and 64% of these were flexible and asymptomatic. This was important because it was the first real adult um, or study looking at adult flat feet in the literature and not much is described about treatment until the 80s. This slide is just placed up here as some things that can mimic a flat foot, but it's not really the spectrum of this talk. A flexible flat foot can become a problem with an Aquinas contracture, and this can cause pain. Uh, more typically, what we think of as an acquired flat foot in an adult is a, a normal arch height that becomes a low arch. And again, the source of why this occurs is controversial. I think for residents, this is an important slide just for OID memorization. Um, it's based on the posterior tibial tendon as uh, the cause of deformity. The basics of this table are that as you progress in severity and rigidity, you progressively go from tendon transfers and hind foot osteotomies to lateral uh, column lengthenings to hind foot fusions, and then eventually, if it's very severe, to triple arthrodesis. In taking a clinical history, it's important to keep in mind that a flat foot is very common in young children. Uh, you should ask them about shoe wear, skin problems, ligamentous laxity, family history of flat feet. If the arch is progressively becoming lower, that could suggest that you need to do some sort of intervention. And the history of pain typically progresses from medial to lateral, where the end stage is the uh, hind foot contacting the fibula and causing calcaneofibular impingement. On physical exam, you need to evaluate foot shape, evaluate for rigidity of deformity, and test for equinus contracture, as these can all uh, help guide your treatment. Um, looking at the patient from behind, you can see hind foot valgus, and also here a very obvious too many toes sign, where you can see all of the toes of the foot, showing the forefoot abduction. It's also important to test for rigidity of the hind foot. Um, which uh, is uh, shown here that this is a flexible flat foot with a toe raise test. Um, if your patient, this is less commonly um, used, but if your patient is unable to rise up on their toes or unable to follow commands, such as in a young child, you can use the jack toe raise test, which utilizes the windlass mechanism by passively dorsiflexing uh, the toes. You can restore arch height and sometimes pull the heel into a little bit of varus. Uh, unfortunately, these videos aren't going to work. We were struggling with them before. But I think most of us in Seattle um, have been had this hammered into us. Uh, the important point here is that if you don't control the talonavicular joint while doing a silver scold test, um, you will get a false impression that there's not an Aquinas contracture. When you watch this video, you actually see that there's some dorsiflexion through the midfoot, and it's not all through the ankle. And if you watched it closely, you'd also see that the lateral border of the foot actually rotates up and out of the image, and you can't see the lateral border of the foot anymore. Whereas when you control the talonavicular joint and you look at the anterior border of the tibia and the plantar lateral surface of the hind foot, um, you can really get a sense of an Aquinas contracture. And basically what you're doing by locking the talonavicular joint is swinging the calcaneus underneath uh, the talus and not allowing any motion to come from anywhere but the ankle. I'm looking at imaging parameters. Uh, the tail of first metatarsal angle is very important on the AP and the lateral. Anything greater than four degrees uh, difference on the lateral is abnormal. And relative dorsiflexion of the first ray um, suggests a flat foot, whereas abduction uh, on the AP suggests a flat foot. Um, it should be noted that you don't have to get x-rays on every flat foot that comes into your office if it's asymptomatic, especially in kids. Talonavicular coverage angle is a measure of the articular surface of the navicular and the tailor head, uh, less than seven degrees of normal, and you can see that the tailor head is becoming uncovered by the navicular. Um, calcaneal pitch is another one that you can look at. Uh, normal varies when I'm reading about it, but 20 to 30 is about normal. Less than that is a flat foot, more is indicative of a cavus foot. Um, you should keep an eye out for these things when you're looking at these images because uh, it can help you guide your treatment. And uh, in summary, a flat foot is a normal foot shape until it is painful. This is especially true in children and usually occurs with Aquinas contracture, pain that is. 
Um, history of progressive deformity or pain is an indication for intervention. Uh, you should examine for the things that we discussed and use your radiographs as the gold standard for measurement and help guide treatment decisions. And the posterior tubular tendon, I would argue, is associated with but not necessarily the cause of a flat foot. Um, uh, here are my references. Again, thanks to Dr. Mosca and my dad. I'll try to get a picture with Dr. Mosca uh, after this, um, but I'll get out of the way for him. That was great, Adam. It really, it really was. It covered all the things that I was hoping that he would cover, so I wouldn't have to cover them, and I won't cover them. <laughs> um, and uh, I've learned a lot just from a few emails back and forth between you and, and Bruce about uh, the difference between kid and adult flat feet. I'm obviously focused on the child's foot. So once again, I thought it was a great job. <coughs> Flat feet are normal. I, I came to Seattle to join Dr. Staley, who did all the work showing that most babies are flat-footed and the arch develops if you just leave it alone. And if you put something under the arch in the shoe, it also develops at the same rate. So I came here with this leave flat feet alone, and I still to this day, many years later, decades later, I believe that flat feet are normal. There's some outliers, and the outliers are the painful flat feet that we see generally in adolescents who have flat feet with tight heel cords. It's not the flat foot that's the problem generally in symptomatic adolescent flat feet. It's the tight heel cord that makes an otherwise asymptomatic flat foot into a symptomatic one. So when there's a tight Achilles tendon or triceps or gastrocnemius that limits ankle dorsiflexion, the subtalar joint knows that it can evert and dorsiflex. So Adam was talking about that. Eversion is up and out. The subtalar joint, the acetabulum pedis, externally rotates and dorsiflexes. So eversion flat foot is dorsiflexion through the wrong joint. But it looks like dorsiflexion. The problem is that it leaves the tailored head exposed for pain. So when pain people have flat, kids have flat feet, tight Achilles tendons, there's pain, tenderness, callus formation under the head of the talus. And eventually, in time, going from medial to lateral, as you said, then there can be impingement type pain in the sinus tarsi when the talus and calcaneus bump together. So what can you do? Well, um, if the flat foot's normal and a flat foot with tight Achilles tendon is not normal, stretch the Achilles tendon. The challenge is stretching the Achilles tendon is easy if your subtalar joint is naturally locked in neutral. But if your subtalar joint is everted and dorsiflexed, then when you stretch your Achilles tendon the way I do mine, you actually don't stretch your Achilles tendon. The flat footed individual with a tight Achilles tendon only further everts the subtalar joint rather than stretching the Achilles tendon. The subtalar joint has to be neutralized by inversion, again, as Adam showed, and this piece of rubber that some doctor in Chicago sent to me is a way of inverting and locking the subtalar joint, aligning the tails calcaneus and navicular, and then any dorsiflexion is through the ankle joint because the subtalar joint can't dorsiflex. It can't evert anymore, and that's what you would try to do. It's very challenging, especially in children, to teach them this maneuver. You can put a towel under the midfoot, but it's very hard in kids to do this. But that would be the goal. <coughs> so what about orthotics? You have a flat foot with a tight Achilles tendon. It hurts. It hurts under the medial midfoot. And you put a hard molded $700 orthotic under the foot. It makes it worse. The talus can't dorsiflex. The Achilles tendon said ankle cannot dorsiflex. Tails cannot go up. So if you put something hard under the head of the talus, all you're doing is increasing the pressure and stress under the tailor head more pain, more callus formation, more disability. So if you're looking for a reason to operate, put a hard molded orthotic under the foot. What about surgery? So I've tried to read everything written in English for the last hundred or so years. And there are a lot of articles written on how to surgically manage flat foot, but in most cases, we don't know what the indications for surgery were. And the thing that are pretty clear is that soft tissue release and implications do not work. That tendon transfers don't correct deformity, just like deformity correction doesn't balance muscles. Taking bones out certainly doesn't make sense in a normal child with a flat foot and a tight Achilles tendon. We're not talking about arthrogryposis or Freeman Sheldon. What about putting things in there, the uh, so-called arthroresis? Well, arthroresis, many reports, many problems, many complications, and podiatrists generally put them in, orthopedic surgeons generally take them out because they create pain where there wasn't pain or make the pain that, that was there worse. So no, there are no validation studies. The concept of the procedure is even kind of interesting. And you might note that there's no arthrosis of any other joint in the body. 
You don't have arthrosis of the shoulder or the knee or the hip or those other unimportant joints. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so what about osteo uh, arthrodesis? Um, the septal joint is the shock absorber of the body. You just can't eliminate it. You have to keep the shock absorber going, especially in children. In adults, well, they got less miles to put on, but in kids, you got to keep it moving. And then there's osteotomies. The calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, a, a concept developed by Dylan Evans from Cardiff, Wales, um, was great, great concept. In 1975, he described this concept of lengthening the lateral column to correct flat foot deformity. My concept of it is that this osteotomy is the salter osteotomy of the foot. <coughs> we all agree that the hip x-ray on the top has a low center edge angle. It has acetabular dysplasia, not just in the frontal plane, but three-dimensionally. And we can look below and say that that flat foot also has a type of acetabulum pedis dysplasia. The salter osteotomy <coughs> is a three-dimensional realignment osteotomy of the, acetab of the acetabulum that corrects the center edge angle, but not just in the frontal plane, three-dimensionally. It reorients the acetabulum to fully cover the uncovered head. Well, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy does the same thing, three-dimensionally. It corrects the center edge angle on the AP, but in three-dimensionally, it takes a subtalar joint, tail and navicular joint, acetabulum pedis, that is everted up and out to inverted down and in. So it, it's, it's the salter osteotomy of the foot. It corrects all components of the eversion of the hind foot with a fairly simple operation, though there are a lot of details that you need to perform to make sure that it works the way it's intended. So what are the indications for flat foot? They're pretty strict. Most, most kids with flat foot should not undergo foot surgery, any type, arthriasis, calcaneal osteotomy, anything. Most flat feet are normal, but some are painful, particularly those in adolescence with tight Achilles tendons. So the indications for surgery are severe valgus eversion of the hind foot with, um, oh, the whole thing. Um, with failure of prolonged non-operative attempts to relieve the pain. And the pain and callus formation is under the head of the talus and eventually an impingement type pain in the sinus tarsi. So the indications are the most important. Most flat feet do not need surgery. But if you're going to operate, there are three deformities that you need to look at. There are always two deformities and possibly a third. So the low-hanging fruit is the valgus everted hind foot, the flat hind foot. The cause for the pain is the tight gastrocnemius or triceps suri. And all flat feet have supination of the forefoot. If the forefoot were not supinated, then when the hind foot is in valgus, an individual would walk on the first metatarsal. But flat feet, the flat footed people walk on all metatarsal heads. So if the hind foot is in valgus eversion, the forefoot has to be rotated in opposite direction or supinated for all the metatarsals to be on the ground. In young children, when we correct the hind foot deformity, the forefoot supination some, sometimes corrects itself. It pronates, just as for reasons that aren't exactly clear. But in older adolescents and adults, when the hind foot valgus eversion deformity is corrected, the forefoot supination deformity is uncovered, it's rigid, and it needs to be corrected. And and the details are really key. These are the things I've written about, and, and the details are just critical. They're critical because between 1975, when, when Dylan Evans described the concept, but didn't have much to say about how to do it, in 1995, when I published my first article, there were very few done. And when I talked to people, they said, well, I tried it, it worked, I tried it again, it didn't work. Or I tried it, it didn't work, I never tried it again. It was the right concept, but there are fine points that need to be uh, identified and addressed in order to make the surgery consistently successful. <coughs> so the first is, make sure you need to operate. The strict indications are absolutely the most important. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole operation, but just say there are certain important features. Number one, you need an extensile exposure. And the modified olea is both cosmetic and extensile, better than the longitudinal incision that, that Evans talked about. The, um, <coughs> the soft tissues on the lateral side are going to try to prevent the osteotomy fragments from distracting. You have a bone column, you have a soft tissue column. And when, once you cut the calcaneus and you try to distract the bone, the perineus brevis, the abductor digitum minimi are going to not want it to go. They'll say, look, I like my length. I'm not going to go. So they need to be lengthened. The perineus longus bypasses the lateral column. So the perineus longus actually is left intact. The position of the osteotomy. Uh, Dylan Evans said to cut 1.5 centimeters proximal to and parallel with the CC joint. Well, that's right in and through the middle facet. 
Little facet's important. The anterior facet, not so much. Posterior facet's important. But it seemed to me that the better thing to do would be to start proximally, and the critical angle be the same, and angle distally to go between the anterior and middle facets, thereby making it an extra articular osteotomy. Don't, don't cut through the important middle facet that the child's going to be standing on for the rest of their lives. So the position of the osteotomy is really, really key. The calcaneal cuboid joint is not so much a stable joint many times. So if the osteotomy is performed and the fragments are distracted, there'll often be dorsal subluxation of the anterior calcaneal fragment, the subluxation of the calcaneal cuboid joint. That leads to abnormal stresses on the joint that can lead to arthritis later. And in fact, if the anterior fragment goes up rather than down, it limits the amount of deformity correction. What to do for it? Cut the bone, put a wire retrograde across the center of the joint, and it cannot subluxate. Two solid objects, you put a wire across them, they can't subluxate. No subluxation, great deformity correction, and no chance of having degenerative arthritis due to abnormal pressures on the joint. The bone graft. This osteotomy is not an opening wedge. It's an opening lengthening um, distraction osteotomy because the cora is in the head of the talus. It's not in the calcaneus. We don't put a, a triangle in, we put a trapezoid in because the, the calcaneus doesn't contain the cora. The cora is in the head of the talus. So the, the size, shape, and position of the graft are critical. And here you can see that was before the distraction. There's with the lamina spreader in. And that went too fast. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's with a graft in, lining up the forefoot and the hind foot. <coughs> so that's what corrects the deformity. What happens on the medial side? Well, on the medial side, there are soft tissues. The tibialis posterior is stretched out. The telonabricular joint capsule is stretched out from prolonged eversion. So if you only plicate the soft tissues, the foot looks great in the operating room, and then it immediately collapses. When I mentioned earlier about operations, soft tissue plications on the medial side do not correct flat foot deformity. You need bone procedures, like the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, but you need to support the medial side with re removal of the redundant <coughs> tissue. So we can Z-shorten the tib post. We can take out the redundant capsule on the tail navicular joint. These are just additive to the deformity correction achieved by the lateral column lengthening with the osteotomy. <coughs> So then you get to this point. You had a foot that had dogs of the hind foot, all metatarsals on the ground, and then in B, the hind foot is corrected with the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, and boom, there's supination deformity of the forefoot. If you go home at that point, the child cannot walk on the heel and the fifth metatarsal. The foot will collapse, the hind foot dogus will, will uh, redevelop, and then you'll blame the osteotomy for not working. No, you didn't work. It wasn't the osteotomy. You left a deformity. You left an unbalanced foot. So, intraoperatively, you say, this is a foot that has rigid supination. I need to correct it. And you can do this through the medial cuneiform, either by opening or closing wedge osteotomy. And then, when you correct the rigid forefoot supination deformity, you end up with the sketch on the bottom left. Calcaneal lengthening corrected the hind foot dogus eversion. The midfoot osteotomy corrected the forefoot supination, and then obviously you have to lengthen the gastroc or tricep surrey, whichever was contracted, because that's the reason you're in the operating room in the first place. You wouldn't be there if it was just hind foot dogus and forefoot supination. And you can get pretty impressive uh, correction, even with very severe flat foot deformity. So now I'm going to go back. I just told you how to do the operation, and I don't expect you to be able to run out and do it, but would say that if you're going to do the operation, you really need to do all the steps, address the soft tissues and the bones, look for all the deformities, correct them all. It, it really matters. It's not just stick a piece of bone in the lateral column of the foot. So now I'm going to tell you what I've actually been talking about for about 25 years and came to all these conclusions through literature reviews, through work of Dr. Staley. You all know what a cochlear review is? Residents, you know what a cochlear review is? Yes, they have all these smart people in different fields of science who get together and they review a topic. And, and, they, and they do meta-analysis. They try to come up with the best <laughs> research articles and then come up with the best conclusions from, from those studies. So again, many of us who talk about flat foot, 
have, have written about these things, and this summary in 2011 is absolutely spot on, makes me really feel good that I haven't wasted my, my voice in 25 years. Because what they said is that the very definition of flat foot is debatable. We know that there's low arches and then there's flat feet. There must be some breaking point between the two. It probably doesn't matter, but the definition of a flat foot is debatable. The available prevalence estimates are limited by, for a lot of reasons. Again, what's the difference between low average normal and, and flat? There are more flat-footed children than adults. Remember those charts that Adam showed from Dr. Staley? Pediatric flat-foot reduces with age. Again, those charts. Most affected, most flat-footed children and adults are asymptomatic. Joint hypermobility and increased body weight may increase flat-foot prevalence independent of age. Pediatric flat-foot is often unnecessarily treated. Goes back to, again, what are the indications? And again, not only for operative treatment, but even for putting the $500, $600 molded orthotics in kids' shoes. If, they're not, if, the, if the flat foot is normal and it's going to develop on its own, why waste the money? Very little evidence for the efficacy of non-surgical interventions to affect the shape of the foot or to influence potential long-term disability. Flat foot doesn't have long-term disability in most cases. Many low-cost generic orthoses can provide good support, make shoes last longer, and if there is some activity-related pain, not from a tight Achilles tendon, just because overuse syndrome, they can help. But it doesn't change the underlying structure of the foot. It just may make the shoes last longer. And customized orthotics only for special cases, like arthritis, which is not idiopathic flat foot. No evidence that supports the use of surgical correction of the typically asymptomatic and flexible pediatric flat foot. Surgery is only indicated at the failure of thorough conservative management. And they even had a part in here about arthrorhesis, those implants in the sinus tarsi, saying that the indication for arthrorhesis remains controversial, but there's a high reported complication rate. So, honestly, this really made me feel good about my last 25 years of, of saying all this through what I read, though they probably read more than I did, and they had a group to come up with these consensus issues. My message is flexible flat feet in children and adolescents are normal. There are some outliers that hurt. Those have the tight Achilles tendon associated with the flexible flat foot, and if you can't relieve the pain and allow normal function in adolescence, it's appropriate to, to perform surgery. The best surgery happens to be a combination of at least one osteotomy of the hind foot, possibly a second of the midfoot, and the soft tissue procedures that need to go with that, including the very important lengthening of the triceps psoriae or the gastrocnemius, whichever is contracted. Thank you. pictures of Adam in diapers to show, although I reserve the right to show them later. <coughs> so surprisingly, I have very little difference of opinion with the discussion of um, pediatric flat feet. The literature in adults is, is quite a bit different than that, but I think the adult flat foot is actually quite similar. So um, as Vince just finished saying, flat foot is a type. It doesn't imply pathology. The vast majority of a human adult flat feet are normal not a disease process. A cavus planus and neutral are all just descriptions. A flat foot that has a low arch, hind foot valgus, and forefoot abduction at varying degrees of version is the, usually the group that we're talking about. There are other foot types, you know, you describe the forefoot as Egyptian or Roman or Greek or Germanic or Celtic, and these are just descriptions. They're not a pathology. So what's important in adult flat foot is the plumb line. Where does the weight of the body drop in relation to the floor in relation to the foot? So if you have the axis of the foot uh, coming down along this, or the body weight coming down along that red line, then at every heel strike, there's going to be a lateral torque on the hind foot. And every time you laterally torque on the hind foot, you're going to strain the posterior tibial tendon. So most of the adult literature talks about the posterior tibial tendon as if it's essential and it's not, as if it's causative and it's not. The posterior tib tendon gets irritated by the mechanics of the foot when it gets out of alignment. So your goal for treatment is to get the heel in the plumb line, so at heel strike there's no torque on the hind foot, and get the forefoot in the plumb line so when the heel rises up, again, the weight stays in the axis of the foot. Those are the only goals of surgery, and there are a variety of ways to get there. So to understand how this works, let me get that other one going. This is a relatively normal arc of how the hind foot works on a CT model. 
Where's the heel going? It's going posteriorly and laterally when it everts. And look at the slope of the posterior facet. That determines where the hind foot goes, that slope. It's a simple inclined plane with a little curve in it. And if you look at the AP view, as it goes into valgus, the navicular and all of the cuneiforms follow the cuboid. The cuboid follows the calcaneus, and all the midfoot bones follow the, cu uh, the uh, cuboid. So that's the essence of it. Um, and it's not arch height. Arch height doesn't matter at all. As Vince said several times, flat foot is normal. About 15 years ago, I was taking care of a college basketball player who had extremely flat feet that hurt. He had a tight heel cord. And I said, I'm a little bit concerned. I wouldn't do anything now. I'd use an orthotic now to tip the hind foot. But I think later in life, this is going to be a problem because you have a tight heel cord and a very flat foot, and you have a little bit of hind foot valgus. So his father, who was in the NBA Hall of Fame, kicked off his shoes, and his feet were like pancakes. He'd played 15 years in the NBA with no arch whatsoever and a tight heel cord. So everything you read about flat foot does not apply to African American feet. It applies to European feet. So European feet with valgus and with abduction, that's our target group. So what is the difference between the flat foot that hurts and the flat foot that doesn't hurt? This is one of our early papers. Randy Ching uh, was a biomechanist at the University of Washington, and Deeran Anthakrishnan was a graduate student in uh, mechanical engineering who then became an orthopedic surgeon. And back in the early days of computer modeling, we did a little project on symptomatic flat feet. We took the CT scans of 15 feet that we had operated on for deformity, and we abstracted, we drew little lines along each of the joint surfaces of the middle, anterior, and posterior facet, and then we abstracted them into a model, and then piled them up in another model, and then created a surface. This is very early computer modeling. This is 20, 15, 20 years ago. And then we created a model of the surface of a non-symptomatic foot and a flat foot that was symptomatic. And the red is talus and the blue is calcaneus. So what's happening is the calcaneus is shifting back posteriorly and laterally away from the talus, and it's actually subluxing. It's not just going to the extremes of its position, but it's subluxing. And Bill Ledoux, uh, who I think is somewhere in the audience, helped make this a little more sophisticated a few years later, where we actually made complete bone models of all of the bone types of the hind foot and showed that the actual shape of the bone determines the position independently of soft tissues. The bone can only put the foot in a particular position. And we followed that a few years later by looking at the relationships among the bones. So now we have a picture where flat feet have abnormally shaped bones and have abnormal relationships between the bones that are there. It's a combination of shape and subluxation. It was, it's defined, as Adam said, by the relationship between the first metatarsal and the, hind, and the talus because that's the relationship between the hind foot and the talus. And it's typically described as columns in the foot. So the medial column is pictured here. The routine story in the literature is that the medial column is, is um, long and the lateral, the lateral column is short, so you have to make the lateral column longer to match up. So here's the medial column. Here's the lateral column abstracted from a real live human's CT scans. And when you pile them on top of one another, it looks like a normal foot. And when you put them back together, it looks like a normal foot. So what happens if you rotate the talus and calcaneus as you would in a cavus foot? You move the calcaneus closer underneath the talus. And what happens on the model, I can't see this cursor on my screen. What happens on the model is that the midfoot rotates. What hap well, with the model, it just superimposes. But in the real world, you can't superimpose. So the cuboid and the navicular rotate. That makes the metatarsals rotate. On the flat foot model, this is what happens when you create the model where you externally rotate the hind foot. This is not what happens in the real world. The, all these cuboid and cuneiform bones stay together as they do on this x-ray, but everything follows the calcaneus. So the column really isn't correct because everything rotates around the talus. It doesn't rotate through the different columns, but around the talus. So the column description is only partially helpful. This is a flat foot patient whose bones have been um, color coded. And if you extract the talus and calcaneus and just look 
at the midfoot, you can see that the cuboid and navicular are side by side, which makes them very flexible. Alternatively, in a cavus, one's on top of the other and there's no flexibility. And if you take away the forefoot bones and look just at the hind foot, you see that the Taylor head is almost next to the anterior process of the calcaneus rather than being on top of it. And here's an actual flat foot bone or actual flat foot person abstracted into a model and you can see a lot of sag along the medial column and irritation and inflammation in the sinus tarsi where it's closed down. So here's the difference between a flat foot, a neutral foot, and a cavus foot. And the cavus foot on the right, everything's on top of itself and it can't rotate. In a flat foot, it's side by side and it's very flexible. So how does that play out? <clears throat> Here are the CT scans of a patient with a flat foot. Look at the axis of the posterior facet. On that initial model, you can see the hind foot skating along the posterior facet dynamically. And if you drop a plumb line from that axis, it's lateral. Here are a left CT standing coronal cuts of a flat foot on the left and a cavus foot on the right. They're both left. It's not a right and a left. They're both left. And look at the plumb line in yellow and the heel strike position in red. So the mechanics are forcing the heel laterally and straining the posterior tibial tendon at every heel strike. So six to 10,000 times a day, you're putting a little torque on the posterior tibial tendon. Here's a model, a plastic model, and you can see as you push down with the floor in the way, the calcaneus has only one way to go. So if you imagine that posterior facet is a little flatter and a little more angled, it's going to go straight into the fibula. So this is, not a, this is not a model we made. This is just a commercially available model. And if you look at the medial column, the same thing happens. The talus plantar flexes and everything stretches on the bottom, just like some of the images we saw a minute ago. And here's a specific patient with flat foot. Uh, the preoperative position of the talus and calcaneus is here. We're looking at the foot from behind through a radio, radio lucent calcaneus, showing a lot of uh, lateralized position of the hind foot. Here's the weight-bearing CT preoperatively with the calcaneus sliding into the fibula. And here's that same patient after an Evans osteotomy where the calcaneus has been lengthened and the calcaneus has slid over. It's no longer eroding into the lateral side of the fibula. This can ultimately result in a dislocation. This is a small subset of patients, but this slides all the way out until it's completely dislocated and the weight bearing is going through the fibula. Uh, Adam went over these uh, lines already, but the bottom line is you want to keep the sinus tarsi opened to keep the relationship between the talus and calcaneus appropriate and the relationship between the midfoot bones appropriate. In a classic case, this is a mid-40s person who has abduction of the forefoot, pain in the sinus tarsi, and irritation in the posterior tib tendon. Preoperatively, you can see the foot is completely abducted over the navicular, and there's a mild sag. The patient had a, the adult patient had an equivalent of what Vince was talking about, a lateral column lengthening. This plate uh, holds the gap open and then has a, a equivalent of a cotton osteotomy with plantar flexion of the first ray. You can see the arch returned by that lengthening. You can see the plate in place with the gap in the bone that is filled with bone graft. Allograft doesn't work in adults, but it does in children. And on the medial side, you see a totally intact posterior tibial tendon. There's nothing wrong with the posterior tibial tendon. This is not a posterior tibial tendon disease, but unlike the posterior tibial tendon, the sprig ligament and capsule are torn. They're not just stretched out, they're torn, and those have to be repaired as shown here. So that's the classic flat foot operation for an adult. It takes it from abducted and no arch to normal talonavicular coverage and an arch restored. They're not always that way, and the argument is to get a weight-bearing CT scan. This is a patient who had uh, pain for a long time. X-rays show abduction and a pretty significant collapse of the talonavicular coverage on the lateral view. Here's the CT scan. So on that CT scan, you can see that the middle facet is not only subluxed, but it's abnormally aligned. There's no way to slide this calcaneus back over underneath the talus because the joint is not shaped appropriately to get it there. And look at the slope of the posterior facet. There's no way that this foot's gonna go anywhere but into valgus over the life. Whether it takes weight or time, I don't know, but it's too, you can do a lateral column lengthening in that patient, but you can only do it by doing it through a subtalar arthrodesis because you have to reshape 
those joints with a burr so you can get that cymal line restored as it is here. And on the lateral view, you can watch that talonavicular position change as you bring the calcaneus forward and hold it. So not all of them need an Evans procedure. If there is not sublux subtalar subluxation, you can get away with a lesser procedure. This is a patient whose sinus tarsi is closed down, but the CT scan doesn't show the dramatic abnormal slope of the posterior facet, and it doesn't show, if I could get my cursor to work here, it doesn't show the sinus tarsi with a lot of irritation and arthritis. And on the coronal view, you can see that that middle facet is not subluxed. It's a little out of position, but it's not subluxed. There's no shift, and it's not impinging into the fibula on the lateral side. So this, again, you just have to get it back into the plumb line, and you can do that by two things. One is shifting that heel over medially, and the other is by restoring that medial arch. So here is the repositioned first metatarsal. It's not only angled, it's plantarly displaced because it has slid up to allow that medial column to sag. And here's that same patient with all the lines restored postoperatively. And there are other patients for whom no simple operation works. This is the classic example that I showed at the end point where the subtalar joint is nearly dislocated and the talonavicular joint actually is dislocated. And there's only one treatment for this, which is a triple arthrodesis and the restoration of the software. So in summary, the foot, flat foot is normal. The foot's more complex than two columns. Talocalcaneal position determines what all the rest of the foot does. The navicular and cuboid respond to that talonavicular position. And the morphology is different, and there's subluxation of the foot. Most feet are normal. Painful flat feet have to have a tight heel cord and an altered axis. And the goal of surgery to, should be to get that axis back into the mechanical plumb line. This is not a disease of the posterior tibial tendon. That's a result of the deformity. Thank you. catch it early, you can try to do um, some bracing to let the posterior tibial tendon uh, rest as well as do Achilles tendon stretching um, to try to take a little bit of uh, force off of the posterior tibial tendon. But yeah, I think that's true. I don't know if you've ever seen a ruptured posterior tib in a child, but I think the posterior tib tendon wears out over time, and it wears out because the foot is being torqued laterally and straining it into that deficient area of blood supply. So if you catch them early and you relax the calf either through a gastroc or a tendon Achilles lengthening or stretching and you restore the heel into alignment with a, an orthotic shape like the stretching device that Vince showed where you get the heel back underneath, I think you can get those posterior tibial tendons to resolve. And as I showed in that one, posterior tib tendon is normal about half the time on these patients. So the whole disease process in the literature seems to suggest that it's causative, but it's actually not causative, it's a result. Can you, can you slow down the progression of the deformity with, with perhaps uh, uh, gastroc release and orthotics if you catch it early? So I, I would defer to Vince a little bit on this one, but I have in the past had young adolescents with symptomatic flat foot who've gotten past Vince's age group. And for example, they might have one side fixed and on the other side we'll do a gastroc release so that we can do the other one at the next break or the next summer. And after the gastroc is done and we get them into a shoe, they come back the next summer and they no longer have symptoms. So I think you can, in fact, prevent major deformity by taking away deforming forces become, before they become too stretched. I don't know if that's true in children or not. There's a, <clears throat> so there's a concept of lever arm dysfunction. And the lever arm function or dysfunction relates to the length of the, the effective length of the foot and the strength of the tricep surge. So if there's a neutral thigh foot angle, if the foot's pointing straight forward in the direction of the patella, then that's the longest length the foot can be. And if the foot is externally rotated due to eversion, external rotation, or external tibial torsion, or both, then the, the length of the lever is shorter. So if you have 
a shorter lever because of some external rotation of the tibia and or foot, and you have normal strength of your triceps surrey, you function well. If you have enough external rotation with a short lever and then weaken the power by a gastrocnemius recession, then that couple may go down so far, the couple of, of strength, that you may not be able to stand on your toes. You may not be able to run effectively. So, so if it's a mild, whatever mild means, flat foot deformity, little tight gastroc, it would make sense to lengthen the gastrocnemius. But we don't know when a little flat foot becomes a lot of flat foot. Yeah, I have the same. I don't know if Dr. Hansen wants to comment, but sometimes patients have feet that look alike when they're children and only one foot becomes symptomatic. And I don't know what that trigger is that makes a flat foot become symptomatic. Any thoughts, Dr. Hansen? The question is, there's a lot of literature about the posterior tib tendon being the problem in adult flat foot. And I think um, given that it's not irritated in about half the patients and the patients have an abnormal morphology, I think the role of that is overblown. And Dr. Chansky's question was, can you prevent progression by doing something early, something short of surgery? <laughs> Testimonial. <laughs> he likes to come in and get a CT scan. <laughs> Uh, it's a great question. Dr. Pringle's question was whether we know if that abnormal slope is present in children. And I should have a caveat that I don't actually know it's present in adults because we don't have 3D modeling yet. If Dr. Ledoux is out there, it's on our list. Uh, what we do know is that on adults, on a coronal slice, there's that slope. What we don't know is if plantar flexion of the talus affects that slope. And we don't have data in children because we don't do CTs in children as much because they, there isn't as much to show there. I think it would be a really nice thing to do. We could do it potentially with MR that doesn't have as much radiation. And do you think it's pre-existing or a result of wear and tear? I think the slope is pre-existing. So in the, I'll let Dr. Deldu comment, but in the, we have a data set of CT scans that we've accumulated over the years and we've anonymized. We know what category they're in and we've used that data set to extrapolate created models of the foot. And it appears that that slope is present in uh, the flat feet and it has a different slope, very different slope in the cavus feet. So I believe it's real, but we haven't validated it in a 3D model, only in a 2D model. And I don't think it's been looked at in the foot, in the ch ch child's foot. No, the, the, the weakening the gastroc should make them more braceable. Okay, so we don't want to correct 
we don't want to surgically correct foot deformity in young children because we know that as they grow their spasticity, uh, like high likelihood that they'll have recurrent deformity. So we try to wait as long as we can. But if their tight heel cord is forcing the foot down, they have the thick callus formation pain on the head of the talus and the brace, they can't be braced in neutral because they can't dorsiflex. So in the young child, what's young, maybe under seven, eight, if you weaken uh, even temporarily the triceps surrey or maybe the perineals, then you can at least invert the foot and, and get them in a brace comfortably until the spasticity comes back. But you can delay the, the need for surgery by weakening those muscles. You know, these kids are going to wear braces no matter what. So they can either wear them with pain or they can wear them comfortably. And, and so the Botox is a great way to delay surgery, improve function.